Anything else before we switch gears a little bit? Head back in time. Okay, so that was meant to be an overview of sort of the class as a whole, switching gears and heading from what you know already and then building into what you don't know. So the idea of classical test theory and how one would assess reliability of measurement in that context. That's where we are, lecture three. As a reminder, the missing lecture two is coming later when I'm at my conference. I will have a video for you to watch then about exploratory factor analysis and principal components and why they are a giant waste of time. All right. Okay. So, big picture review, terminology. We are trying to measure latent traits. Uh, a trait means that it's something that's continuous. Latent means that we can't observe it. We're, this semester, we're talking only continuous. Um, in terms of synonyms, the term indicator shows up first in this class because it's the basis of confirmatory factor analysis. They talk about having indicators. To me, indicator is a way to get data from a respondent. So it's an item, it's a trial, it's a task, it can be anything. Certain terms in this unit always have item associated with it, and other ones have indicator more frequently. But I mean those as synonyms. And they can be any kind of response format, not just uh, ordinal or binary or whatnot. They can be truly continuous anything. So how do we know if we've done a good job measuring the trait? There's basically two sides to that. I'm going to skip the validity side for now and focus on the reliability side because validity depends on having the right measurement model in terms of its fit and its predictions in the first place. There are two ways then that people can talk about individual differences in a trait. One is to build a composite of the indicators. So whether it is a sum across responses or a mean makes no difference. There's nothing magical about dividing by the number of items. In practice, though, if you have missing item level data, which one should you do? A mean or a sum? Oh. Mm. If you have missing data, I'm going to say mean on that one. Because if they don't have as many answers, their sum can't be as high. If you wanted to stay in the metric of the sum score, though, you could compute a mean, multiply it by the number of items, and then you'd get back to that same. But be careful with missing data and sum scores. That's why people have means instead in a lot of cases. I also like the, using the mean whenever you're in an ordinal response scale, like something like, say, 1 to 5. The mean, let's say if the mean is 3.5, then I'd know that on average people are somewhere between whatever a 3 means and whatever a 4 means. And I find that useful as opposed to, I have a 67. It's like, well, is that good? To know if that's good, I have to know how many items there were and what the response format was, and then I know what a 67 is. That's less useful. Yes? Is it okay to assume like a 3.5 is between a 3 and a 4 if people taking like a survey don't have that option? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, that's what you're doing. You're, you're, we're treating these as numbers. So the fact that they're not really numbers, it, we're, we're being okay with that. Okay. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that should give you pause because these aren't really numbers if one means this thing and two means that thing. Indeed, indeed. So your alternative then, if you're not going to comp compute a composite, is to use a measurement model that includes a separate variable as the latent trait. And so that's the rest of this class then. So in terms of concerns about how well an instrument works, reliability and validity are the big ones. I'm assuming you've had this types of definitional coverage before in your life. Probably yes. Uh, the one that I like the best, and I don't remember who I can attribute this quote to, but I wasn't the one who came up with it. Validity is measuring the right thing. Reliability is measuring the thing right. I like that. Straightforward. Um, the way that I view these is that reliability is a precursor to validity because you have to be measuring a thing before you can know if it's the right thing. If all you have is noise, it becomes infinitely harder to make an argue, argument about its validity. Um, the reason that we're skipping validity for now is because it's usually based on external evidence. Validity is like, well, 
this sum score correlates with this other sum score this way, but it doesn't correlate with that one, and that's my validity because that's what I predicted based on the theoretical framework. But what if the sum scores are incorrect? Then everything else that you would have to say about how they relate to each other is suspect, or sus, as my son would say. He's seven, but he's already started to pick up the slang. So I think that it makes more sense to think about validity at the end after you have a measurement model that supports uh, the dimensionality and the reliability that you want to have, and then talk about how that trait as you've measured it relates to other things. So one thing that is important to note is that reliability is assuming some kind of known dimensionality of the item that you know that these items all measure one thing, or that you know that these items measure this one thing and these items measure this other second thing. The, that will be step one in the analyses that we do is to see if we're actually right about that and to use the empirical evidence from the analysis to refine our predictions as needed. So in that sense, it straddles the line between what's considered exploratory and confirmatory in hypothesis testing but the confirmatory framework is what allows you to get that extra information about how you're wrong to then incorporate into your revision. So when we're adding things up and computing some kind of reliability coefficient, we are presupposing that we're measuring one thing. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to add them together. So starting with then the idea of adding things up classical test theory. So the classical test theory, as I said before, to me is the logic that underlies the use of a sum score as a proxy for someone's latent trait. And a lot of what follows on this is ways of calculating how much of a given observation for a sum score is because of true differences in the trait and how much of it is because of error. If you only have one variable, though, you cannot pull apart two different things from it without a whole bunch of other assumptions. This is what we're going to call an unidentified model. You got one thing, you can't pull out two things from it. So there's a little bit of logic, belief, and assumptions that have to be baked into this to be able to compute reliability for how much is true versus how much is error. Those things are based on summary statistics. So just to remind you that you know about all this stuff, in this class, we will talk a lot about means, variances, and covariances, and in that respect, it overlaps with the previous class, longitudinal, quite a bit. So just to remind you, you know how to make a mean. You know how to make a variance. You know how to make a covariance, although in intro stats, that's usually skipped over briefly on the way to correlation. But in this class, we are going to be working with covariances, which are relationships between variables in the original scale so we don't necessarily know if a covariance is a lot or not because it depends on the scale of the variables. But you can interpret them in terms of their sign. If the covariance is positive, that means as one person is above the mean on one variable, they're likely to be above the mean on the other. You just can't say how much. You can then back translate those co covariances into correlations that have the familiar minus one to one scale. So in the measurement models that we'll see first in CFA, there will be two different versions of the answers given to us, what's known as a solution. One is going to focus on recreating the means, variances, and covariances. The other will then be the standardized version of those estimates that in turn recreate the correlations. So we'll see all of that stuff, but just to remind you what covariance is, because you've seen it before. Yes, sir? What if the outcomes are on different scales? Can you, how would you... The same way. And that's part of, part of the issue, is that what goes into covariance is both correlation and differences in variance between the scales. So it makes it even harder to look at an estimate of covariance and know what it means in terms of its absolute strength. So a lot of the stuff that we do in terms of summarizing how well a model predicts is to focus on correlation. Because like I can say, your correlation is off by 0.3, and I know what that means. If I said your covariance is off by three, I'd be like, is that good? I don't know. I'd have to know what the scales are. Yep. All right. So for categorical indicators, we can compute a mean if it's binary. 
but we don't need to compute a variance because it's the mean times one minus the mean. Um, for anything that's nominal, means and variances don't make any kind of sense. We would have to know the frequency of each category, and then, then that would be the mean for each difference that would be relevant. So that's a little bit trickier. So for binary, the two are yoked together. So if I know that I have a proportion of 0.5 as the mean of a binary variable, what that means is that 50% of the people had a 0 and 50% had a 1. If I know that is my mean, I know my variance is 0.25 the end. The variance is a function of the mean. It's literally the mean of 1s times the mean of zeros. So what that means, no pun intended, is that the closer you get to the ends of having it be a constant, the less variability you have. And this is one of the reasons why it's difficult to find a relationship if all you have is binary outcomes. Because if you don't have variance, it's hard to have covariance. For ordinal indicators, we can do mean and variance, but they should give you pause. Because they're not really numbers, as you said. Also, the maximum variance that you would get is also going to be limited by the number of categories in the same and analogous type of way. Uh, differences between indicators as they relate to the trait. New vocabulary time. Each indicator is going to have at least two properties that we'll pay attention to. Item difficulty and item discrimination. And this is one instance in which the term item is always used. It's always item difficulty, not indicator difficulty, for whatever reason. Um, the way that we operationalize these things will differ across models. Each model will have a particular parameter that is the item difficulty or is the discrimination, but the ideas hold regardless of which model you're in. So difficulty is the idea of location. So if you think about the construct map and the ordering of low to high, difficulty is where it is on that map. The, the vertical scaling if you're going this way. If you're talking about a latent trait that's not an ability, you can think severity. That, that word works usually just as well. Um, so I would say that an item that has this difficulty level is designed to be most informative for people at the corresponding level of the trait. If you want to measure a large range of people, you got to have a large range of difficulty. Item discrimination, on the other hand, is how strongly the response of that indicator relates to the latent trait. More is better. Zero means they're not related, and negative means, oh, something went wrong. It should not be backwards. So either you are way off on what you predicted for this item, or you need to reverse code it so that the answers go the right way. Generally speaking, for all of these models, you want to make it so that your response options all go in the same direction for the analysis. So that means if you have reverse coded items, you want to use them in that format so that high means more of the trait. If one means more of the trait, you got to flip it so that it's five instead. So items differ in the extent to which they represent differences in the trait. So under classical test theory, under the belief that the latent trait is the same thing as the sum or average across items, the classical indicators of difficulty is just the mean. So how many of you have given, uh, have given tests and gotten like the test r report back from testing services? Do you get that anymore? Do they have these statistics on here? They have like a difficulty column and a discrimination column or an item total? They don't have those? That's unfortunate. Um, they did those at some of the, my other previous universities, and people usually would not at this part. But that's just as well. Uh, they probably give the items mean for each of the items, and that's an indication of difficulty. Uh, the only thing is that it's backwards. So if you have an item that everybody got right, that's an easy item, right? But it would be like high difficulty, according to the way that they talk about it. That is very confusing. Um, that is one of the reasons why in the measurement models for binary or categorical responses in IRT, their model actually has a minus sign in it. It's flipping the direction back to the way that it's supposed to be. 
but it's still, it's considered item difficulty even though higher values indicate an easier or less severe item that's easier to endorse. Um, in the models that we'll, we'll see, this will become some kind of intercept instead. And the intercept and the mean differ in their conditionality. So the mean across items is just the mean. The intercept is the expected mean for somebody conditional on a trait level of a specific value. So then we're breaking the tie between, is this item really easy or do I just have a really smart sample? If all you have is the proportion correct or the score on the item on average, you don't know which the answer is. In terms of, of evaluating how good an item is, especially if you're at the beginning stages where you're looking to see which items should be kept and which ones can go by the wayside, difficulty is usually not paid attention to unless it causes problems for discrimination. Because an item that is functionally a constant can't relate to the either item responses very well, and that might cause it to look like it's a bad item. So difficulty can be a limiting factor in how related the item is to the trait, particularly at the ends of the continuum. Doesn't mean that you don't need it. It just means that there's less chance to show a relationship because there's less information in that item. So under the belief that the sum across items is the best estimate of our trait, item discrimination is the correlation of each item response with the sum score. Now, however, People have figured out that, hey, isn't that like cheating? Because the sum score has that item in it, and wouldn't an item be correlated with itself? Yes, it would. So for that reason, you will often see item remainder correlations as the label of the column, or item rest correlations instead, which means it's the correlation of that item response as one variable with the rest of the scale excluding it. That's our indicator of item discrimination. If an item is highly related to the trait, it should be highly correlated with the trait. But the trait in this case is just the sum across items. Once we get into a measurement model, item discrimination is going to be some kind of slope, a factor loading, a slope coefficient, a multiplier of the latent variable as a predictor. So items that have extreme difficulty, as I said, are going to have restricted range in terms of this, so that's one thing to watch out for. It may look like an item is not related, but if it has a very low mean or a very high mean, that may be part of the problem, in which case you still may want to have it. Because an item that has a very low mean is going to be useful in discriminating amongst people who with low ability, an item with a high mean is going to be useful the other way. All right. So we have uh, the total score is always treated as quantitative, so ordinal treated as interval. We do that. Once we have our total score, we can evaluate reliability, the extent to which we have consistency in our measurement. The idea of reliability, as it is typically described for people, is, an, is a within-person thing. Like if I step on my bathroom scale and it gives me a number, I step off, I step back on, and it gives me a different number, that's not good. I, my scale is not reliable because over a lots and lots of trials, I don't get the same answer. The way that we think about it in this context, though, switches out a different kind of variance to do the same thing with. Rather than have each person answer these items over and over and over and over again, we give the item once over and over and over to different people. And then we try to use the same logic to figure out how much of the variance is true versus error. So right off the bat, there's, like a, there's a, a logical fallacy in how we're thinking about what reliability means and how it's operationalized. So we're substituting multiple people for multiple replications. And we define reliability as how much of the total variation in the total score is actually true. In order to do that, though, we have to find some way of identifying this. We can't pull out two things out of one thing, so we've got to break it into two somehow. So there are many different ways people will go about this, but they all sort of rely on the same set of math to figure this out. You need two scores. If they're both measuring the same trait, then their correlation between them is taken as an index of reliability. Here's all the stuff that has to be true for that to hold. 
So if I have one score and another score, both of them, if they're thought to be measuring the same trait, should have the same T that's in common. They would each have their own error. So for all of this to work, the errors have to have the same variance across scores. The total scores have to have the same variance because they should be the same thing. The errors are supposed to be unrelated to each other and with the total score. So then we have the covariance between two scores divided by the variance or the standard deviation of each. That's, that's the formula for correlation. If we break apart what Y1 and Y2 are here, Y1 is true score plus the first error. Y2 is true score plus the second error. Then we can FOIL that thing. Do you remember FOIL? First, outer, inner, last. That's it. That's my entire memory of algebra. The rest is gone. But FOIL is here. So then we end up with the two T's as the F part. So we have the covariance of the true score with the true score. The covariance of true with error, that's supposed to be zero. True with error two is also supposed to be zero. And error with error is supposed to be zero. So that just leaves the covariance of a variable with itself, which is just its variance. So under this system, we can say that the correlation between two scores is an indicator of reliability, if all of that stuff is true. So there's three main ways people go about quantifying reliability if all they have is a score. Go over each of these. As I said, this is violating uh, something known as ergodicity in some of the within-person uh, longitudinal literature, the idea that we're substituting between-person variance for what is supposed to be replications across a single subject. So first, test-retest reliability. Have you heard of this one before? Everybody has. It seems reasonable. So if I give a test, I collect my scores, I wait some amount of time, I do it again. The correlation between those scores is called test-retest reliability. What could go wrong? Oh, I don't know. What if people change? Do people do that? Hopefully, right? That's called education, where I come from. So test-retest reliability assumes that the trait stays the same. That may not happen. Uh, memory. People may respond differently because they've seen the items before. So this type of, of retest effects or practice effects or memory effects can take a lot of different forms. It can cause higher scores if you think that you get better at something the more times you do it. It can cause lower scores if you get tired of doing it. Either of those can change one's appearance of what their true score would be. And then temporal interval. How long enough is not so long that they're going to change but short enough to where they won't remember the same items and just answer them that way. And who knows? So this type of evidence, I think, is somewhat problematic because you'd have to rule out all of these alternative explanations as the reason for why your correlation is or is not what you thought it would be. Uh, then there's also alternate forms or split half, where you make up two different forms of a test and then you correlate those. That's all well and good so long as the forms are truly equal. So parallel forms have the same means, summary, statistics, experiences, covariances, that kind of stuff. And the only way that that really can happen is if the items are the same. Or you could just take one test and split it in half, and that gives you your two scores that you can correlate. So people might take the even items and the odd-numbered items, sum each of those, and then correlate them. Um, they may also do a little bit of uh, extrapolation as to what reliability would be. So there's something that's known as the Spearman-Brown prophecy formula, and it can predict how much more reliable your test would be if you just had more items. So what people may do is cut their test in half, correlate the halves, and then use this to figure out what the reliability would have been if each half was the same length. Um, this formula requires something known as parallel items or parallel indicators, meaning that the amount of error variance in each item is the same, and the strength of the relationship between that item and the trait is the same, equal discrimination. Those are very difficult to obtain in real data. But this is the logic by which, how do you make your test better? Get more items. What kind of items? More. Look, you just keep plugging in more numbers and this thing goes up. It's amazing. Only if all the items are equally the same. So how all of these things have some limits in terms of what is reasonable to believe. 
a lot of this is requiring things behind the scenes that are testable assumptions. The extent to which the items go together to measure one thing, testable. The extent to which those same items measure that one thing equally well, testable. The extent to which those items have equal error variances in measuring that one thing equally well, testable. All of those are constraints. So there's this whole world that's just being ignored in adding things up without doing any of the stuff underneath it. So that brings us to the last one, the, uh, the which half of the split half reliability. We get to our friend alpha. So alpha, otherwise known as Cronbach's alpha to some people, or Gutman's alpha to those who knew the difference, uh, Rod McDonald. Uh, that is the same thing as what is also called KR20, if you've seen that in some of the other measurement classes. I'll show you that in just a bit. This is the mean of all possible split half correlations. People describe it as an index of internal consistency. Uh, that term doesn't really mean anything. But what I have seen alpha used for is like, my scale has good enough reliability to go and do something with. I have to have an alpha at a certain level or my paper will not get accepted, right? What is that level, by the way? Let's, let's get a survey. What's a good enough alpha in your discipline? What is it? Oh, not, not um, type one error rate. Alpha in terms of Cronbach's alpha reliability coefficient. Like 0.8 is the one that comes to mind. Oh, yeah. yeah, like what proportion of a scale's variance is supposed to be true is like the definition of reliability. People throw the words internal consistency onto this one. But I say 0.8. I've seen articles at 0.6. 0.6. Wow. Okay, anyone else want to play? That's good enough? Yes, sir? 0.6 as well. 0.6. Okay, that's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> right, the good articles are higher than 0.8. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so alpha, we will talk about alpha next time, but here are the things that alpha assumes without testing. That your items that you're adding together and calculating an alpha for are unidimensional. That they are true score equivalent or tau equivalent, meaning they are all equally related to the trait. That they're all equally good and that their errors are uncorrelated. Now, if you're thinking about, like, you know, measuring math or something, and you're thinking of items as, like, 2 plus 3 and 4 plus 5, uncorrelated errors might be a reasonable thing. But what if you're asking about something like social anxiety as your trait? And some of your items talk about, um, you know, public speaking versus you know, making small talk at a party versus like all these sorts of areas in which you can demonstrate social anxiety, you think that the items that have to do with public speaking might have an extra relationship that has to do with that? Pry, and the items that have to do with small talk at parties, which I hate almost more than mint chocolate, another set, right? Like, and so there are ways that these items can have extra reasons for their correlation besides the thing you're measuring. Alpha ignores all of that. Doesn't, all testable, but all ignored. So that's, uh, we'll show you where it comes from and how to get your alpha up. The short answer is get more items. <laughs> what kind? More. So you know what I tell the person with an alpha of 0. 0.6? Get more items. Yep. All right, but it's 314, which means it's time for my social anxiety to take a back seat. All right, any questions or comments as we adjourn for the day? I'm just blown away that, like, they assumed all this without computers. Yeah, well, and that, no, but that's exactly it. If you don't have a way to test it, then you've got to make assumptions to get your job done. So I, I, I am not hating on anyone from the 1940s who did not have maximum likelihood on their smartphone, right, like we do now. They did what they could with the tools that they had. But now we can do better. All right. It's garbage day, which means I say, see everyone Thursday, as opposed, or as opposed to have a good weekend, is what a, when I say when I'm here and it's not garbage day. So let me know if you need anything. Thanks for playing. <laughs> <laughs>